My paper was called, uh, is it time for paradigm change in Chan's studies? And uh, what I'd like to do in my uh, 15, 20 minutes here is uh, uh, in a much looser way, talk about my project in this paper and maybe um, other agendas that are uh, shaping what I do. So uh, let me start with a really clear statement. Um, it doesn't really matter to me if it turns out figures like Bodhidharma or Huynang existed or didn't exist. It doesn't really matter at all to me. Um, that's not what I'm doing. Uh, if it turns out that these figures existed and they brought or manifest enlightenment in China in different ways in a historically reliable way, I'm fine with that. In fact, I'd be happy with that. Um, when I started this research project um, many years ago, I, I had a fairly open attitude to what I might find. And um, over the years, what's come out in my thinking and writing is that that assumption of innocence and uh, historical veracity, it just doesn't work for these texts. And so uh, without the preconception that I would be going to um, a more suspicious mode of reading, um, that's where I've ended up. And so people like to accuse me of practicing, I don't know, radical hermeneutical suspicion and so on. It's actually not true. Um, I started out fairly open-minded. I still feel open-minded. And so the question is today and any day is like, how do we read these texts? What do we make of them? How do we write this history? And I think those are the questions, at least in part, that are motivating um, this conference. I'm happy to be here. Um, while I'm not uh, wedded to any outcome in this discussion, I am uh, committed to a set of liberal arts ideals. Uh, essentially, how is it that we uh, produce information, write history, and share it in our publications classroom, other places like that? Um, I think that uh, here I'm really quite uh, a hard nose uh, in terms of let's be clear about what we know and what we don't know. And what are our uh, agendas as we move through this material and share it with the public? So what I'd like to do today is first talk about um, my methodology. And I think it's fair to say that shockingly, there's very little discussion of methodology in Chan's studies. Um, if you ask uh, anyone to come up with their methodology of reading texts in different genre, um, I don't think we've really had this discussion. What's the best way to read a genealogical text or a dialogue text and so on. Um, so in some sense, Chan studies a little bit slow to wake up to this problem that uh, we haven't done some of the foundational work in establishing the way we proceed. So I thought today, excuse me, I, I go through five points that I um, rely on in producing a close reading. Some of this is quite banal. Um, the first is simply figuring out if you have a text that is, is this a coherent, um, coherently conceived project? That is, is there a, a big beginning, middle, and is there a, a voice or a kind of authority that covers the pieces? Or do you have um, something much looser and much less of a text, maybe a kind of um, conglomerate entity? Anyway, once you've got a text, you, you, you're you convinced that, okay, there's an author here with, um, motivations and skills and a kind of persistent as he or she moves the language across the page and into uh, the reader's eyes and imagination. So once you've, once you've convinced yourself you've got a text, um, then you have to ask, well, what's it doing? Where is it going? What's its agenda? What does it want to do? What does it want to make true at the end of the reading that wasn't true at the beginning? Um, and, and here there's uh, room for a lot of debate. Uh, one might think, some of the genealogical texts are simply about promoting uh, one figure at the end of the lineage who now stands tall as uh, the king of Buddhism. Or you might see that this is a very interesting space opening up where uh, authors can apparently in experimental ways put in all sorts of discourses that gain their legitimacy by nestling into this lineage structure. I can think of a couple ways to situate um, that discussion of what a text is doing. They're, they're all worth debating and also fair enough, intellectually fun. So that's really point one. Well, after you've convinced yourself you have a text, what's the agenda here? Um, second, 
I think we have to ask, how does each Chan text um, fit next to the competition? And one of the mistakes I see in the publications on early Chan is that um, typically people treat texts out of context. And so uh, we don't read, we, we haven't built a genealogy of the genealogists. And I think that's a real shame because once you commit to not looking for that chain of relationship, that chain of, um, of, of competition, maybe we can even say this sort of pattern of envy and replication and so on. If you don't start your history with that kind of um, full scheme of literary participation, um, you're gonna end up with a very limited view. And um, frankly, that's where we have ended up that um, we're taking texts out of context and not thinking about this larger uh, literary climate. I think we can even say something like a, um, yeah, almost a club of authors who are reading each other carefully, borrowing bits and pieces here and there, and maybe most importantly, committing to um, a kind of uh, game. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but a kind of uh, competition in which there are rules and there are expectations and um, a real family resemblance between the products these authors are, are coming up with. So point two then would be text, um, you know, kind of intertextual uh, context in the competition between them. Third level of analysis is uh, just typical. Like you look at, uh, look for um, how is language being used in the text uh, on its own terms, but are there repeating patterns, are there kind of tropes that uh, seem to be doing heavy lifting in, in the development of the discourse. And then you take that and put that with the point I just said about the competition. Are, are there patterns of, uh, within these tropes? So as I'll be talking about later, and it's all in my paper, um, what's, what's this basic trope of the Taoist sage doing in, in Chan Buddhism, where many Chan masters are dressed up to look uh, like Taoist sages in terms of their simplicity and their um, closeness to nature and um, their disregard for literature, key point. Um, so anyway, uh, that's level three, just looking at the um, way the text fits into a history of literature that's much wider than the current competition. So you read, um, you read a biography of Hui Nung against um, Confucian classics, Taoist classics, um, particularly the late so, um, And then you even go back to the Lotus Sutra, Diamond Sutra, see how this text is part of this uh, world of familiar references. And, and so far as we moderns care about history, I think we have to um, engage as much as possible in recovering that kind of familiarity of reference. That's, that's nothing new there. Okay, fourth, fourth level of close reading um, is we shift from thinking about this wider horizon of literary references. We think in a much more sociological way um, or anthropologically about how Buddhism as a religion in medieval China has to negotiate with uh, political realities, economic realities, um, class realities and so on. This is uh, basically an attempt to bring anthropological insights into the way we read these texts. And, and this again, shouldn't be controversial. Like it's hard to imagine a religion that doesn't involve itself in negotiations with all the other powers that be. That's uh, a given, I think. The fifth level analysis is a little bit harder to encapsulate, but nonetheless quite important. And that's where we start talking about how uh, a text and a discourse um, functions as a, a religious reality. And by that, I mean that there are things that almost all religions involve themselves in, and that if you study religion, you ought to get good at recognizing. One of them is simply that religion will always be playing a kind of um, almost accordion structure between private and public, that religions are about bringing individuals and families into larger organizations. And so all religious discourse sits within that assumption of um, needing to build the, the rapport between the individual and the group. Um, second on the level of religious realities is religion's all about authority. Um, show me a religion that's not about authority. They all are. Um, if you don't have authority on hand, 
you don't have a leg to stand on. So religion is gonna be about articulating, defending, and in the end, um, both advertising and always selling uh, a certain form of authority. And here, uh, things I think are quite interesting uh, insofar as you need the public, the other, to buy into your system. So there's this interesting kind of uh, dynamic, a kind of um, intersubjectivity where you don't have authority unless someone else thinks you have authority. Just like in basic identity, I'm not who I am unless I can convince you in some measure that that's who I am. All right, with authority, <clears throat> it's a little more interesting because um, typically in religion, you put authority at some remove, either in the past or in some ethereal transcendental zone. Um, and you put it there because you want your authority to look that perfect, that transcendental and so on. Um, even if it's in the past, it has a kind of, of perfection and glow just from distance, but then you need to bring it into the present. And so I'm um, thinking about Chan literature on this level five of close reading. You always have to look at, at, at this dynamic. In, in what sense is Chan um, essentially a new set of techniques for constructing a vision of perfect Buddhist authority, what I call the voice of final authority and moving it um, into the present, into China, into the capital, Chang'an, Luoyang, so on. Um, this is the basic agenda of Chan, as far as I can tell, that um, the discovery, the slow discovery comes throughout the seventh century of ways, and really we're talking about a kind of, um, a kind of courage, a kind of chutzpah, kind of um, commitment and confidence that Chinese authors show about bringing the Buddha's perfect language of supposedly of total truth and putting it into Chinese bodies, right? And then pulling that language out again in, in discourse records of different kinds. This uh, toing and froing of bringing, bringing from beyond perfect language and truth and then giving it to the public um, begins to get at the dynamics of how um, Chan writing uh, works. So those are my five points uh, for close reading. And next to this, I would say, besides those uh, concerns that in the case of Chan, you've always got to be looking at the power of recycling and that Chan is nothing if but recycling earlier layers of truth claims <clears throat> or the different splendors and grandeurs of the masters. Like <clears throat> Chan writers can't stop writing about this past that they keep uh, enjoying and sharing out for others to enjoy. So this power of, of reusing what other people have already sanctified is I think uh, has to be front and center of how we uh, talk about uh, Chan text, Chan reality. So uh, lots to think about on that front. So let me sum up what I've said in this paper, what I'm saying today uh, is Chan's not really about practice. It's not about meditation. Uh, it's really a literary movement that slowly emerges in the seventh century. And you can see um, almost step by step how it happened. Um, to see it though, you have to look at the details, you have to follow um, texts that no one's particularly interested in. Like no one's done a close reading of the Faru biography, except for me. Um, no one's done a close reading of Dufay's Chuan Fa Bao Ji, the records of the transmission of the Dharma Jewel. I could go on, like we haven't really done this legwork and we should have five, 10 versions of close reading these texts and we should be getting better at it as we go on. It's not happened yet. So um, I'm saying Chan is a literary movement. You can trace its development. It has some fundamental um, issues, some fundamental tricks, um, dance moves and so on. Um, and I thought I'd uh, in a somewhat succinct manner, give you five um, things that I think are characteristic of Chan as a literary movement. Um, parentheses, in the paper, I spent a lot of time showing that Chan's not about meditation. Um, if you read these texts, it's obvious. Um, they're doing a whole bunch of things besides promoting um, a new kind of meditation. So I'll leave those of you who are interested to go into the paper to look at how I um, move through the text to <clears throat> make that point. All right, returning to my five points about Chan as a literary movement. The first thing that Chan 
literature does is it localizes perfect truth and tradition. I mean, first you might think, well, that's a kind of weird thing to do. Why would you do that? Well, in, in accord with my methodology just mentioned, this is crucial. Every religion needs to localize, focalize um, its source of truth and tradition. And in the case of Chan, what's distinctive is that it's moved from a range of other sources in the Chinese Buddhist tradition. That would include top of the list, sutras, right? You read a sutra and the sutra, typical diamond sutra or what have you, will tell you that the text itself is the be all and end all of tradition, right? That's, that's a act of localizing or focalizing truth and tradition. Chan disrupts that set of uh, textual claims. The, sut the cult of the sutra is completely undone by the, the Chan writers. Similarly with um, thinking and that stupas or monasteries or particular power sites um, are holding truth and tradition. Chan's taking um, those claims apart and instead localizing truth and tradition in the bodies of Chinese men, dead or alive, um, or at least in the figure of these men as they appear in literature, right? a little bit trickier. But at any rate, what we're trying to do is get truth and tradition into a Chinese body however you imagine that, okay? So we're here, we're here now with truth and tradition <clears throat> in terms of final authority. And the second thing that happens and goes hand in hand with localizing is privatizing. No one wants to say this, but it's obvious. Chan is all about um, privatizing truth and tradition. Truth and tradition used to be out in a much wider sort of zone of availability, especially via the sutras. You sit down with the Malakirti and Yudesha, you're having, uh, on the text terms, a relationship with the final version of truth and tradition. And that's why it's so exciting to read. With Chan, um, those other zones of truth um, are being overcome, subsumed, negated. Um, all those things are happening because Chan's saying there's only one source, and it's that man over there, that master, who can show you, or his historian can, that he's connected to the Buddha directly. So it's that act that I think counts as a kind of, is a kind of violence um, on a symbolic level to all the other people on the field of Chinese Buddhism who would like to believe that they have a piece of the action when it comes to truth and tradition. So this act of privatizing um, tradition has really been underplayed in, in the secondary literature. Uh, it's a way of keeping people out, right? So one of the things that I find particularly annoying is when people read Chan texts and come away with the sense that this is truth for everybody. And that, that Chan in some ways is a reform movement, even a democratic movement to bring truth to the people. I think that misses that there's a two-step gesture here in Chan. You first localize truth in the master in a convincing manner, and then the master performs for the audience, for the reading public, and there's a kind of splash over effect. Yeah, as a reader, you get to look at the master inherit truth and speak of it, but in a sense, you will always be excluded from it unless you're in the lineage, right? You, it, it sets up a pattern of longing, of desire, and so this is elemental in Chan. I, I think you can't find a Chan text that doesn't work like this. This is what it is. You get a master, you load him with truth, you get him to speak in a compelling and um, seductive manner and the public come, build it and they come because it's exciting and it didn't used to be available truth in this um, intimate, immediate manner. Okay, so that was point two, we got localizing, Privatizing three is glamorizing. So Chan's all about um, giving the reader a view of Buddhism in the most glowing uh, sort of, I don't know, tarted up manner that you can think of that suddenly truth comes not through hard work, not through reading, not through like years of discipline. It comes in a zap and it comes in with splendiferous effects and uh, it's all so exciting, right? But you're not really there, you get to watch. This is a game of, of, 
of being a spectator. In some sense, Chan, is, Chan literature is about building these, um, I don't know, they're sort of spectacles of, of, of truth that are, are put before the reader. And so uh, it turns out that in the case of medieval Chinese uh, writing, the way you glamorize a, a Chan master in, in writing uh, is you deck him out in a range of Taoist and Confucian um, motifs and imperial motifs. And if you're reading Chan text carefully, you need to look to see, well, okay, Hung Ren, Fa Ru, um, Hui Nun, doesn't matter who, they're getting painted according to certain profiles that are very well established uh, in the Chinese canon or the Chinese imaginaire. So this glamorization of, of, of the Chan master is really fascinating to me, uh, particularly because we have authors creating images of truth holders, the masters who are free of literature. And so there's this tension in Chan, it's, it's everywhere, that authors want to imagine, or authors want their readers to imagine that we could have tradition without literature, tradition without historian, tradition without tradition, really, because this is a hyper tradition. This is a, a kind of mega tradition or a, a tradition on another level, really. That's really the, the Chan claim. Okay, so that's point three. Point four is, as in so many cases with religion, you got to naturalize the whole package. So it doesn't look like you're doing exactly what you're doing, which is writing up um, new inventive literature about people that may or may not have existed. So the key to any Chan text is for it to disappear as a piece of literature, as a piece of art, as a piece of um, kind of a, a, an attack piece, if you will. So um, as you're reading a Chan text, you need to think about how is, how is the rhetoric pointed or, or, or um, situated so that as you read, you don't realize that you're in the middle of someone's careful liter literary stratagem, right? That um, this is the, uh, the art of disappearing as art. And it's all over um, early Chan. If you, the Platform Sutra is a great example. The, the author invents Hui Nung as an illiterate author who then goes on to give the narrative and you have a sense, well, this is just history. Um, there's no author here in charge of this very complicated um, narrative, which in the end is talking about itself as a piece of literature. Um, this, this, this problem of naturalizing uh, the ownership of truth really also uh, goes hand in glove with almost everything Chan represents. Certainly by the song, um, this is the basis of so much Yulu writing, right? It's like tradition manifests itself free of tradition. Um, so many acts of truth giving uh, are effected by the masters using non-traditional elements, whether it's yelling, kicking, beating, um, an offhand remark about flags, whatever. Right? Um, these all act to show the reader that there's some higher level of transmission completely free of anything thinkable on the level of, of, of cultural and social realities. Okay, final point five here. What Chan does is, uh, Chan literature does is to traditionalize this rather inventive form of discourse. And here, we're kind of talking about uh, several of the other points, but by traditionalize, I mean, Chan wants to look like its truth claims, though the newest thing on the block are in fact, totally uh, traditional and therefore old and sort of echoing uh, down the hallway of long um, cultural claims of the past. So uh, that's why you see when Wang Wei invents Hui Nung in, in, in his uh, epigraph, um, you see the return of all this classical language, Buddhist, Taoist, Confucian, like Hui Nung's body is made up of quotes from the classics. And that's of course, an, a fine example of recycling, but it's doing something else. It's allowing the reader to suddenly re-engage his cultural roots, uh, re-enjoy all these old um, stories, vignettes and stuff that are now put in the present and in a kind of um, exciting and almost sort of jangly present uh, manner, right? So uh, it, it's recycling tradition, but it's also uh, an assault on tradition because the old parameters have been broken 
And now uh, we have a reconfigured entity, Weinung, who holds all these disparate elements in a, in a very exciting and in a way troubling manner. Okay, I'll wrap up with two points here. What I've been arguing for about 20 years now is China is basically an art form. And in that sense, it needs to be read against the Chinese uh, delight in writing uh, faux sutras in China that pretend to look like they're translations from an Indic language. Um, and then a step further back to India where Mahayana writers are writing in the same kind of ironic mode of taking final, the final voice of authority and doing what they want with it. And so if it's the Lotus Sutra or Vimala Kirti or what have you, um, these authors are completely refiguring tradition in a way that's been underappreciated by modern uh, scholarship. We uh, tend to find such discussions um, upsetting or un unnerving because they show us the creation of tradition and that mode of creation is, as I say, ironic and that raises a lot of questions that so far um, we haven't handled very well. Even though I think philosophically, this is the most interesting part of this, of these different forms of literature. And why? Because you can see the human mind working through um, what it takes to be the essence of religion and how it refigures those realities for the continuation of tradition and so on. Like the author then is this very interesting pivot point where we can learn a lot about how people thought about received tradition and then thought about how to reenact or uh, yeah, just reproduce tradition. Right there, the author is this fabulously interesting um, pivot of re reception and reproduction. So I'm arguing Chan's an art form where the author performs this uh, very interesting role. It's not the traditional role. And people will say, why aren't you talking about the Chan master himself? And I'll say, well, the Chan master really is the author's creation. And so talking about the author as creator is the closest I can get to talking about the Chan masters by and large. On this level of art form, I do wanna say one other thing that Chan seems to be uh, particularly good at a new kind of staging, a staging of the ownership of tradition. So if you read carefully in the Faru biography, if you read um, Shunhui's texts, both the dialogues and then uh, defining the true and false, you'll see that by mid eighth century, um, authors are getting good at giving you historical events, seemingly historical, in which partisan politics are working out. Platform Sutra works really good as an example. Um, and that's because as you read, you think um, history is simply the case of uh, a recording and uh, duplication of what's happened. Instead of somebody putting these pieces together, with some very dramatic effects expected from a faithful reading. Once you're done reading the Platform Sutra, you think Shun Shou, um is a, is a miserable loser. Hui Nung's the best thing since um, sliced bread. Whether that's true or not is a secondary to the fact that the text is designed to make you come to that conclusion and not understand that it was um, through the wiles of a, of a very careful um, historic faux historic writing process. Okay, so that staging of, of ownership, I think warrants a, a, a good bit more attention. Final thing, if you're familiar with eighth century Chan texts, you know a good bit of them don't talk about lineages. And so we have a range of uh, texts attributed to Bodhidharma. Some of them are even playfully attributed to nobody. And they're just uh, faux dialogues like Wu Xinlun or uh, Zhuilin Guan, whoops, what's that? I forgot the title of that one. Um, anyway, uh, if you look at these, you'll see that there's a kind of um, giddiness, uh, there's excitement that um, seems to be pushing Chan authors to write and write and write some more. Um, and what they're doing often is redefining tradition. So you have these patterns, these chains of, of, of what is original mind, what is seeing your original nature, how does this drop you out of samsara? This, so this kind of um, swirl of uh, a newfound, a swirl of language around kind of a newfound appreciation for um, 
freedom from older styles of writing about truth in China and in India. And so in some way, Hu Shi, I think was right to say Chan represents I mean, he always used this dramatic language, sort of, you know, breaking free of the shackles of the ideology of India and blah, blah, blah. like, I'm not really saying the same thing. I'm saying the Chan authors, once they convince themselves and, he, and their audiences that we can talk about total truth here in the present, once that became acceptable, uh, the the impetus to keep writing in that voice seems to be seems to have been irrepressible. And that's why Chan literature is so um, extensive, right? Once you start feeling that voice and a right to speak or compose from that voice, uh, you can see how um, intoxicating it would be. All right, uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I will say I look forward to debating all these points and see where we end up. Thanks for your time.